story of how I got to be where here I am today. Ta-da! So, um, we are going to start at the beginning. So, I was born in 1980 to two wonderful parents. Um, and they, uh, they kind of realized that they had nailed it with one girl. And so, they went on to have four more boys <laughs> in our house. So, this is our house. Um, me and then four boys. So our house was pretty much always like a three-ring circus. Um, there was always kind of crazy stuff going on, and I think um, that's part of what made me um, really love community, is coming from a big family. My extended family is even bigger, um, and for me, it kind of grew a love of being around a lot of people, um, doing fun things together, feeling a place of belonging, um, and things like that. Um, so if I had to summarize my life, I would probably say uh, not all those who wander are lost. So it took me a long time to kind of find uh, my niche in life. At the age of 17, I knew that I had a calling on my life to serve, but I didn't really know what that looked like at that time. It kind of took me a long time to kind of flush that out. So after high school, I took a couple years and um, I did missions uh, work for a while. I traveled around Europe. I worked odd jobs. I just kind of did a bunch of different things until um, I ended up going to school. Uh, I, I ended up starting college at the age of 22. Um, so I got a, um, a degree in psychology with a minor in substance abuse counseling because I thought that would be a uh, like a meaningful way to serve people. Um, so after college, I was kind of burnt out on school, and so I kind of really realized that I wanted to do something with like the creative um, part of me. So um, right after I graduated college, I started something called um, Other People's Property. So Other People's Property, I sell vintage clothing, and I organize uh, clothing swaps, and I do uh, personal styling, and all that fun creative stuff. And I still do that stuff to, to this day. So I love, I love the creative, I love aesthetics, I love beautiful things. Um, so all the while, during college and after college, I was working in events, so I did like large scale, large scale events. Um, so I kind of learned, learned that. And then eventually, I ended up working for Downtown Credo. Um, I had a high paying part time job with them um, that I, really enjoyed, as we all, we all love Creo. Um, and so I really, I really, my, I was still very much longing for a sense of community and kind of like creative mornings, bringing all these wonderful people together and how do we work together. And so I was also, along with Credo, working on my own community space. And that's really where I kind of wanted to land. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like um, a little bit about my background. So, well, Hell if I know. <laughs> um, so I guess I thought I would start at the definition of, of revolution. So the dictionary says um, that revolution is a fundamental change in power or organ organizational structure that takes place in a relatively short period of time. Revolutions have occurred through human history very widely in terms of methods, duration, and motivating ide ideology. Their results include major changes in cultural, economic, and socio-political institutions. Um, but really, revolution, uh, revolutions come about through people that are doing unique things and willing to stick, you know, stick themselves out there and really kind of birth what is inside them. Um, so I found this quote by the modern dancer Martha Graham. Um, so she mentions, each one of us is unique. And if we didn't exist, something in the world would have been lost. I wonder then, 
why we are so quick to conform, and what the world has lost because we have. Um, so as I was kind of like getting myself together and figuring out like what, um, how to talk about this, my first thing was, maybe I should talk about just a couple of the revolutions that have meaning to us and that have kind of shaped where we are in our nation today. So bear with me because I'm, I'm painting a very broad stroke of revolutions, but I just, anyway. So here we go. Uh, the American Revolution. <laughs> Thank God, right? We would not be here without that. <laughs> okay? The Industrial Revolution, it changed like our work structure and the family dynamics and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the Social Media Revolution, which in the past, what, 15 years has changed the way drastically that we communicate. Um, so this was the Arab Spring Revolution that kind of was brought to mind, brought to mind uh, four to five years ago how um, social media was, uh, was really a tool and something that really created change in the world and I thought that was pretty, um, pretty amazing. Um, so when I uh, sent uh, my PowerPoint, this PowerPoint to my brother, Peter Rockmore, to help me put together this fancy slideshow, um, he was very quick to inform me that it reminded him of an eighth grade history lesson. Um, so I'd just like to publicly thank him right now for his vote of confidence um, in my talk today. So we are, however, gonna look at a couple more revolutionaries and their impact on the world and how that kind of impacts us as we kind of think uniquely and all that kind of stuff. So, um, what I find interesting about revolutionaries um, is that they are bringing to light something that people didn't want necessarily or think that they needed yet. Um, but without these things, like no major change would have happened. Like this guy, Galileo. So he challenged the idea, both uh, literally and metaphorically, that, um, that we are not the center of the universe, right? That changed everything. Um, he was almost killed for it. So, crazy, we'll just uh, run through these. This guy again, right? Um, we wouldn't be here without George Washington. Um, an underdog nation took on the most established nation and sent them packing back to Britain after a five years war. So, thanks to this guy, we are all here speaking. Um, so this guy, Henry Ford, amazing. So he said, um, if you ask the people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So when you think of revolutionaries, you usually think of MLK. Um, he showed the world what resilience and kindness can prove. Um, he turned the other cheek so that it was painful for others to watch and eventually brought their enemies to their knees. Um, and he did die for this. Um, Mother effin' Teresa, what's up? <laughs> I mean, extreme kindness, that is revolutionary, right? Let's, <clears throat> let's get on board with that. Um, have you ever comprehended what it's like to sit with a dying or to clean somebody's wound or to hear their last words? Um, somebody that would do that is pretty incredibly revolutionary. Um, so these guys, uh, Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg, um, they turn computers and the way that we communicate on our heads. We, I mean, 15 years ago, we, we communicate and interact on a moment by moment basis, completely different because of these guys. Okay, here we go. So, uh, last but not least, I might want to add um, Tina Fey. <laughs> so, she might not really rank up there with all those other revolutionaries, but dang, I love this woman, okay? <laughs> and she has done a lot of things for women in show business and just badassery in general. Um, so anyway, okay. So for a lot of these revolutionaries, um, it was bringing a concept or, or a project or a methodology um, that people didn't want or didn't know that they wanted um, until the person um, birthed something new into the world, and then after that, the world rallied behind it. So, revolutionaries have a way of writing their own script, not the one that current society tells them they have to, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so, I just got finished reading a book by Don Miller, 
called Scary Close. It was really good, great read, easy read. I would recommend to you all. Um, so he uh, mentions a couple things that I think are lost on our generation. Um, the first one, I am willing to sound dumb. Um, so, hey guys, I think that uh, the, uh, the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. Um, okay, what? No, okay. Um, I am willing to be wrong. Um, Henry Ford could have pushed something to the market um, that nobody wanted because people wanted faster horses. Um, I am willing to be passionate about something that isn't perceived as cool. Facebook wasn't, um, it wasn't an overnight sensation, like nerd alerts. It was a bunch of nerds, and they pushed it forward, and now you're checking your Facebook right now. So, um, the next one is, I am willing to express a theory. So, I have a theory or a dream um, that all people can coexist peacefully, right? That's pretty, pretty, pretty revolutionary. And the last one, I am willing to admit I am afraid. As in me, right this moment, <laughs> right here, right here, here we go, all right. So, um, let me uh, back up and tell you um, a little bit more about my story. So, uh, back in 2013, I was um, working towards this community space that I wanted to uh, bring about, and it, uh, that I'm still working on to this day, but it was taking very, very, long time in coming. Um, so I said, screw it. Um, I told Credo where they could find me, and they said, bye, Felicia. Um, so I emptied my savings account, and I went to Australia and New Zealand for three months. And I loved it. Uh, it took a little while for me to kind of like not be working all the time, because that's kind of my MO in life all the time, and I hadn't had a vacation in a long time. Um, so I loved it. I could do whatever I want. I could sleep in, I could read a book, I could watch a movie, I could go explore the city, I could go eat, I could kind of uh, do whatever I wanted, and I loved it. And so um, the funny thing is that I thought that I was going to come back from my trip really rejuvenated and restored and renewed. <laughs> However, <laughs> Coming back from my trip had me like um, really depressed and kind of angry. And I had kind of hoped there would be some forward motion with this community space that I was working on when I came home. Nothing had moved one inch. Um, I had spent all of my dollars on travel and adventure. And I had left my, my high paying job at Credo. Um, so I came back from my trip. And I was totally broke. Um, and my like dream of this community space was going nowhere fast. And I just didn't know what my next steps were. And so I was like, oh, cool. Um, I really didn't know what kind of direction to move in. So a little while after I got home, a friend of mine posed some questions to me. And he said, uh, what brings you life? And what brings you joy? Um, and what are uh, you're not doing that you should be doing. So I thought on that for a little while, and I um, had always joked if I could throw dinner parties for a living, that is what I would be doing. Um, so I gave it a go. Um, I, I thought to myself, so I love food primarily, and then I love people, and I would see people out a lot, but you make small talk and whatever, shoot the breeze. But I really felt like I don't really know people that well. I don't know their stories. I don't know where they're from. I don't really know that much about them. And on the other hand, I know a lot of, I know some people really well, but I know some people that don't know each other. So I was like, okay, I have this idea. So I'll just throw everyone's name into like a hat. And each week, I'll call seven names to come join me around my dinner table. This is not my dinner table, but you get the point. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I thought, yeah, I'll invite um, seven people plus myself. I'll provide a couple of drinks. I'll, prov I'll provide a lot of really good food and a couple of questions to sit around the dinner table with. Um, and so the dinner party project began, and that was our 
first kind of invitation. Um, so um, at this point, I, um, I started to uh, get some responses from people. And I was like, oh my gosh, some people might show up to this. Like, fabulous. I mean, I didn't even know if anybody was going to show up. So it was, it was pretty awesome. I started in um, August 10th, 2014. That was our first dinner. Um, and people started showing up and really enjoying it. Um, and so I had started an Instagram at that point, and then after that I <clears throat> opened it to the public um, about 10 months ago, 10 months ago, and the rest is history. Um, right now we do about uh, 10 dinners a month, and we have over 750 people on our list, and it's going gangbusters, and most of that is because of social media and just word of mouth, um, and it, it is growing daily, so it is a lot of fun. Uh, so for me, I never set out to bring on a revolution. Um, I just pursued what was flowing out of my heart and out of my being, which was to connect, um, to build an authentic community, um, which, was, which is something I think that most people would acknowledge that they, that they want. Um, the fact of the matter is that I didn't really know how much people were wanting meaningful community. Um, I was just kind of doing me. So that's kind of just how I started. So for us today, um, maybe what we don't know yet is how much we do need to connect with people. Um, and it's not really in like how many you know, Facebook friends we have or how many likes we get or how many events we get invited to, um, but it's actually just like truly recognizing that something in you aligns with something in other human beings. So I had, um, I had a woman come to a dinner once, and she said, uh, if you're not hanging out in a church in a bar, it's really hard to find people that you're really meaningful, like a meaningful way to get connected to people. Um, so when I started this thing, I didn't know it was going to be a thing. Um, so I was, I was a little surprised when all these requests for invites to come to a dinner started rolling in. Um, and so it was just kind of, I was kind of, um, realizing more and more, like over, throughout like these past 10 months, kind of I've been realizing more and more um, that people don't know where to find meaningful community. And that's something that they really want. Um, I know that there's a lot of social clubs and events uh, happening around town these days, which is awesome. But the Dinner Party Project offers a little bit of a different platform. You're sitting down at a dinner table with seven other people, and your voice has to be heard in that conversation. Um, and for some people, that's the easy part. I mean, some people will talk the, would talk the entire time if you let them. And then some people, it takes a little bit of coaxing um, to kind of have, to have them add their voice. But the fact of the matter is that everybody at the, around the dinner table um, is engaged in the conversation. And um, so technology is an interesting thing because of, you know, relatively, re you know, revolutions in um, technology, we have things like Facebook and Instagram, um, and kind of we are now more connected than ever, but like are we really more connected? Um, just because you see stuff about people doesn't mean that you know them or that you're connected to them. Um, honestly, there's days that you, are, I'm flipping through Instagram and everyone is posting photos of their amazing vacations or their adorable newborns or whatever, and you have to fight discontentment. You know, like that's, that's a true story for everybody. Um, because you're not in relationship with them, you're just seeing these surface things about them. Um, so technology does have its place for sure. Um, this past week, my friend uh, Ben posted an article on social media um, about uh, what might be the cure for addictions, and it's not, it, it might not be what you think. So in this article, it mentions the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. It's human connection. It talks about how rats, when in isolation, are given the opportunity to have uh, water that's laced with heroin. Um, when they're in isolation, they will return to that water over and over again until they eventually kill themselves. However, if you put a rat into a cage with other rats or a rat community, um, 
It will pretty much ignore the water with heroin because it's too busy with its friends. So the subversive story here um, is face-to-face -face interaction, uh, bringing out the best in people, um, re reminding others that we are not alone, seeking not always to be in our own tiny little friend groups, um, learning about the different things that are happening in our city, um, Sitting down with a diverse uh, group of people leaves you a different person than when you came. So over two and a half hours, um, a couple of drinks, um, four amazing courses, um, you would be amazed at the connections that happened um, in real life with real consequences. So um, I'm not proposing that my little solution um, of dinner with strangers will turn the tide on heroin users. Um, however, I do hope it will help people uh, feel a little bit more known, a little bit more connected, and more adventurous in connecting with other human beings. So uh, come join me at a dinner sometime soon. Don't mind. That's the easy part. <laughs> yes. Um, hi. Hi. This is Faith. I actually attended one of your dinners not so long ago, Sweet. a few months ago. Um, and I was curious, you talked about your hyphenate job at Credo, and I know that down at the Dinner Party Project is also a donation based model. I thought maybe you could speak a little to that concept of the do donation based model to make something happen. Sure. Um, so she's asking about the donation-based model for the dinner party project. So for the dinners, um, when I very first started, I was just like just covering my cost. So it was like the donation was incredibly low. Um, it was like thirty-five dollars, and that just basically covered all my food. Um, and then from there, as I realized, like it was like I was like doing more and more dinners, and then now we're at ten dinners a month, and. Um, I was like, okay, well, we have to, you know, figure out different solutions because I'm spending a lot of my time on this. So I really wanted to have a range of, of not pricing anybody out from coming to a dinner. So like, obviously, I have to cover my costs, which are not inexpensive because I'm buying expensive stuff, but not make it, uh, you know, not just like giveaway seats, you know, but just to allow like starting at a lower point and then, you know, having this range where people can give what they wanted to. If they want, if they, if they have a you know, what you would normally spend out, you know, eating out at a, at a nice restaurant. Um, but I, I wanted to allow people to have that option, to be able to give what they wanted, to be able to participate in it and not price people out of coming. So. How often do people connect outside of the dinner party? Um, pretty often. Um, yeah, we, after, after you come to, come to dinner, we give you the email addresses of everybody that came. So I do see a lot of times people continuing the conversation after they come to a dinner. Um, I, I mean, there's people that have gotten jobs out of this. There's people that have gotten like really great friends, a lot of connections. I mean, you will start to see a little bit more people around town that you've met at a dinner. So, yes? Do people use their phones at a dinner? They do to take photos, right? Because that's part of the experience. So yeah, we discourage people from you know calling their girlfriend or checking Facebook, and usually that actually doesn't happen. So we encourage people if they want to take photos and post them on Yelp or post them on other social media sites. We love that stuff, but it's kind of nice that people kind of leave their phones for a couple of hours and they're not really engaged in that. So sorry, I'm late. Um, is the selection still random? It is. Yep, it's still random. So. Um, you mentioned like people kind of taking a little time talking to themselves. Do you do any type of monitoring of mm -hmm. that to kind of make sure it doesn't get out of hand? Or does that happen much? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it does happen sometimes. Uh, some people like to talk a lot. So yes, there is a host at every dinner. So there's one host and then seven um, random guests. And so that host kind of really makes make sure that every voice is heard around the table. So sometimes you have to kind of navigate it to somebody else or something like that. So some one person doesn't dominate like the whole conversation. So Yeah, related to that, you said that you often will you'll pick a couple of topics or things that people know about like how do you 
how do you think about those topics in advance and, and, and do the conversations get out of hand sometimes or, or, or uh, controversies created? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. Um, for most of our dinners, we have random questions, and so these are just questions that I think are interesting. So it could be something um, kind of serious, or it could be something a little bit more lighthearted. Um, sometimes things do get interesting and political or something like that. And so the purpose of the dinner parties is really about focusing on what we connect on versus maybe not as much what we don't connect on. So we have a little bit of like give and take and a little bit of that conversation, but I try not to let it go down a rabbit trail about like teacher salaries or something that, you know, sometimes people are like very passionate about things. I get that. And I'm like, we can continue this conversation after, you know, the dinner. But yeah, they, they can get interesting. <laughs> no fights yet that I know of, but. Has there been like a, a, like a really bad question that you've asked that just like went super bad? And then like the flip side of that, what do you think is like your best question to ask at a break? Oh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to give away the good secret. Right. <laughs> um. So, has there been a bad question that I've asked? Gosh, I guess, I think that there was one that I, that I, that bombed. I can't remember what it was. I have erased it from my memory. Um, one of my favorite questions is, if you could enable one thing into law, what would it be? That's always a good one. What do you think is revolutionary about the no. Um, I think the face-to-face -face interactions of sitting down with strangers um, and just being a little bit vulnerable and sharing about your story. Yeah. <laughs> do you change the design aesthetic each meal, or do you have like a standard layout that you use for the meals? A, de a design aesthetic? Do I change it? Um, I often change it for most of the dinners. Like we do, I mean, like fresh flowers every week, and um, so sometimes we do change it up. So, yeah, that's the fun part. What are some like the major challenges that you might have had starting this, and what are some of the things that you have to sort of revamp and take a second look at, you know, when you first started? Sure. I mean, when I started, I didn't, I didn't realize like how rapidly it would grow. Um, so I mean, logistical things like just like spreadsheets and how we intake the donations and how. I mean, right now, uh, so much of it is manual of how we communicate with all these people that are, that we uh, communicate on a weekly basis. So, I mean, just really boring logistical stuff of how we, how we manage information and how we communicate well with timely people. Whoop, I lost one of my mics. It's all right. One's good enough. <laughs> Go. uh, so what are kind of your dreams or hopes for the future of this? Like, where would you like to see it go? Sure. Um, for Orlando, it's really growing, and that's really fun. Um, we're doing some fun projects. Uh, we're doing... Uh, next month, we're doing um, a fundraiser for the Audubon Park Garden District. Um, so we also once a month do a themed dinner around a topic or a theme. And so those people are not random. They are around a certain subject. So we've done like fashion and food blogging and social enterprise. And this one's going to be a French theme. So it's on Bastille Day, uh, which will be kind of fun. So really, for Orlando, being able to explore uh, different um, different topics and really gather those people within those industries and have them connected and say like, hey, here's what, like I work in film, you work in film, like I just wanna know what you're up to or let's, let's support each other, or just know what's happening. Um, for the bigger picture with the dinner parties, um, honestly we've gotten uh, requests from other cities and so right now I'm just working towards yeah, being able to figure out how I can expand to other cities and do this. We did one in Nashville a couple weeks ago, and I think I might do another one in the fall. So that might be like the next city for the dinner parties. But we'll see how it goes, where it goes. Take one more question. As a host, have you gained any sort of insights into the Um, I don't think it's drastically changed, but I, um, I'm always learning. Um, I'm always learning kind of, yeah, how to read people, how to direct things, how to let things, um, how to let the conversation go, um, kind of sometimes when to cut it off, um, and just how to make the night flow as seamlessly as possible and engage everybody in, in the night. So, yeah, I've, I've definitely learned a lot, that is for sure. 
One last one. Okay, Kelly. Yeah, for sure. So if you'd like to join us, um, you sign up at our website, which is uh, thedinnerpartyproject.co. And if you go to the website, there's just a sign up tab. So basically, once you sign up, your name is entered into the lottery. And then at random, we pull out those names, and then you get invited to a dinner. So that's the name. Yes. Do you have to resubmit your name? Nope. Oh. Yeah. Your name just stays in the lottery, and then once your name is pulled again, you'll sit down with a different group of seven people. So no two dinners are the same, which is a lot of fun. So.